all that you do, uh, Lord, God, I just pray if somebody that's here tonight or watching online, if they don't have a relationship with you, God, tonight you will draw them uh, to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. So Mark chapter 4 and 5 is where we're going to be tonight. Uh, this is kind of continuing our, our series. Uh, so tonight's title is Faith in a Frenzied World. All right, got a cool little graphic up there that I, that I found. All right, so life is often dominated by confusion and noise. So one of the most constant things I read about the teenage experience and I hear from you is how much stress characterizes your life. I hear stress over and over, stress of exams, stress of a boyfriend or a girlfriend, uh, just work. work, going to school, doing just doing life. You face increased expectations and demands. The I feel like the expectations for like school now is way different than it was when when I was in school. Like I, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said that you can get like a 5.0 GPA. Is that right? You can. All right, so uh, you can only get a 4.0 when I was in school. I mean, just like totally no grid for that. All right, so there's the noisy world of, of social media where you're always connected and always managing not only your own issues but everyone else's you see everybody's issues we escape from the world to our devices because we want to run from the uncomfortable or the frightening and what we find there is uncomfortable and frightening i mean you can just go on anything and just see like chaos and noise and there's this constant you know news cycle i mean there's a 24-hour news cycle now. I mean, the yeah. news is on 24-7. It's, it's crazy. Like, 30 years ago, you had the new, the 5 o'clock news and maybe the 6 o'clock news, and that's all you had. Now it's 24-7. So it's not just a digital frenzy that you face. What about friendships? Your parents might find, find it hard to keep up with who you're currently mad at. Maybe. Yeah. And which of your friends aren't speaking with you right now? And maybe you can feel abandoned or alone. You know, it's, it's hard. For some of you, you have an unsailing family home life. Maybe divorced parents and you're caught in the middle of everything. And these are the years of your life when you get introduced to the fact that people suffer in this world. And... Suffering is, is all through the Bible. And it's how we respond to that suffering. Hey, Jesus suffered. Too. Jesus did yeah, suffer. We saw that in your last well, Yeah, just last week. So, today, tonight, I want us to look at how we can have peace in chaos. How we can have peace in chaos. And uh, Jesus is going to show us that tonight. So, in Mark chapter 4. And five, we see Jesus confront the chaos in this world. All the mess and unrest and opposing forces, but there's a word Jesus speaks that is louder than the noise in your life, and that is peace. And here we're going to see three scenes of Jesus stepping into a broken world and bringing it under his care and his control. Four miracles that reveal the authority and remedy of Jesus over the sea and wind, demonic possession, sickness, and death itself. He reigns over all the powers that are hostile to God and bring distress to you and me. From the large collar side, and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was at the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? 
And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So this story begins in verse 35 with Jesus leading the disciples to cross the sea. So getting out on the water and facing the storm was Jesus' plan. And he doesn't do things like haphazardly. Don't think that Jesus won't sometimes lead you into chaos. Everything can feel like it's unraveling and you're still right where you're supposed to be. So don't hit the escape button every time. Don't hit the, hold on, I just need to like run away. Too many people when they encounter difficulty or something that feels like it's beyond them, get disillusioned. They think something's wrong, and so they, they want to get out of that friendship, that school, that family. But sometimes we're right where Jesus intends us to be. Here, a storm comes, and it begins to tear into the boat and fill it with water. So let's picture this. They didn't have Grady White boats back then. They didn't have Jones Brothers. Those are like the two most expensive boats that I can think of. They had, like, John Boat, all right, made of wood, like junk boats. I mean, even though they're like professional fishermen, they had junk boats. Let's just be honest. And let's just remember who Jesus was with. He's got Peter. He's a professional professional fisherman. He knows how to navigate the water. He, he's, he's a boat guy. And now this storm comes and these fishermen are terrified. It's sudden and I'll, I, did y'all catch that? It said Jesus was asleep. He's chilling. He's chilling. He's asleep on a cushion at the back of the boat. We benefit from knowing this story already, but put yourself in the place of the disciples. About now you begin to think that Jesus is like out of touch with reality of what's going on. Everything is going wrong and clearly Jesus doesn't get it. By the way, when life begins to scare you, you will be tempted to turn on and accuse the people God has put in your life to help you. You can do that to your parents. You can do that to church leaders. Here, the disciples do that to Jesus. They're like, bro, do you not care that we're in this storm? And I'm sitting there thinking, of course Jesus cares. The whole reason is he's in the boat and on this planet and inside of the chaos is because he's going to die for them. In moments of tension and fear, our true beliefs get revealed. And that true belief here for the disciples was that they didn't believe Jesus. They didn't believe who he was. They didn't trust him. But Jesus breaks in, look again at verse 39 of chapter 4. He says, And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. If you break this down in like, the original language, he basically tells the wind to shut up. That's how it breaks it down. He silences the growling of fallen nature. He interrupts it, imposing his kingdom on unwildly forces. So when sin enters the world in Genesis 3, everything is fallen, even the creation. And Jesus is like, you know what? Wind, be quiet. Shut up. In verse 40, he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? He's like, You have your Lord and Savior. Yeah, and I'm, he's basically like, Right here. But notice what happens next. Look at verse 41. And they were filled with great fear. So they were, they were afraid because of the storm. Jesus rebukes it, and now they're afraid again. There's, they have another fear. Then they, they ask, who is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. And he's the one who created the land and the sea. They had taken Jesus just as he was. And now they see him for who he really is. The waves respond to their maker. Jesus brings order out of disorder. This is just showing how amazing Christ is and his power and his authority. And all you guys have sense that. If not, then the chaos you encounter in this world will be overwhelming. It will be like that storm to the disciples. They overwhelm them. Even though that's 
Some of them, that's what they, they lived on the water. But it overwhelmed them because of the chaos, they bought into it. Everything will lack proportion. Mark here wants to impress upon you an accurate picture of who Jesus is. One day, Jesus will calm the storm by being thrown into it. Just like Jonah was asleep in the boat and cast into the sea to be swallowed by the fish, Jesus will be cast into death and swallowed by the earth, but come bursting forth on the third day. We just celebrated that. Jesus kills the chaos in the world by letting it swallow him whole until it chokes. Jesus takes that wrath. He takes on the wrath of God. He takes on the chaos. He takes on all the uncertainty that we face. Jesus and the disciples reach the other side of the sea, but when they arrive, there's another storm in front of them. Look over in Mark chapter 5 and verse 2. It says that when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So they go from storm to like dude with demon possession. I mean, like exorcist, you know, head spinning kind of stuff. I mean, crazy. The Bible teaches us that there is more to life than what we can touch, see, or put in a test tube. There is something called in the spiritual realm, and this affects all of us. Because we have a soul. There are real beings called demons. And don't try to like just be like, ah, oh, that's just some hocus pocus, fairy tale, movie kind of stuff. It's in the Bible. It's in, yeah, absolutely. It's in the Bible. The Bible doesn't connect every single problem we experience to demons, but it does have a real category for de demonic oppression and influence. There's a spiritual dimension to our existence and in the world around us, and we would be foolish to ignore it. This passage paints a portrait of a demon-possessed man. Mark chapter 5, verse 3, it says, He lived among the tombs. He lived in a graveyard. I don't know anybody in their right mind that wants to go live in a graveyard. That's just weird. He made his dwelling places in death. That's where he wanted to be. In verse 3 and 4 it says, And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he ripped the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. This is something that natural efforts can't fix. It can't be controlled. In verse 5, Night and day among the tombs, and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. It's hurting himself. He had a pattern of cruel self-injury and self-destruction. This is a picture of total isolation. He's utterly alone, left to despair, and there's a distortion of who this man was created by God to be. They're in chaos in the human soul. Whether or not they're demonized like this man, there's something every person experiences. But pay attention to the contradiction in the story. This is a man who runs to Jesus, identifies Jesus, but rebukes Jesus. Look at verse 6. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you done with me? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. So there was a guy, his name is Sinclair Ferguson. He wrote a book about the gospel of Mark. And he said, would you not think that a man with such a profound need would yield readily to Jesus, the deliverer? Theoretically, he would. But to think that that would suggest we understand the human heart all too superficially. No man yields to Jesus easily by nature. Tragically, like Legion, because they, they, this Demon is like a legion. There was a multiple of them in him. Men often hold on to their bondage and evil rather than yield to the pain of transformation by Christ's power and grace. We can be just like this man, so close to freedom, and yet still wanting to cling to what has held us captive. Notice how Jesus restored him. It takes radical measures. Look at verse 8. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. 
And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Verse 11, now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillsides. And they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So Jesus is having a conversation with this, this, these demons. The demons know who Jesus is, and they're like shaking because they know that Jesus can, boom, they're gone. So he gave them permission. Listen, y'all catch that? He gave them permission. Jesus gave them permission. He's got power over the demons. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000. 2,000 demons in this, in this bank. And now they're in the pigs. They rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. So the demon's purpose is to destroy the creation of God. Jesus shows that these forces will never again enter this man's life to torment him. Jesus restores the man to wholeness. Look at the new picture in, in verse 15. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were not afraid. Do they celebrate what they find? No. They beg Jesus to leave. The men cared more about their herd than they did about the tormented human being and more than they valued the Savior. Sometimes God's work of restoration in someone else's life comes at a great cost. The question is, do we have patience for that? Patience is in short supply today and it shows up in our final scene. In this story, Jesus allows himself to be interrupted by two needs. And while he displays incredible patience with the people who ask for help, he also teaches them patience as they experience the fear of their circumstances. Look at verse 21. And when Jesus crossed again in the boat to the other side, so he went to this side, across the sea, now he's going back to the other side. A great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. So he didn't even get a chance to get out of the boat hardly. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is to the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years. All right, so here are two tales that's going on. Twelve years ago, a girl was born. A new life entered the world. Twelve years ago, a woman contracted a condition that will define her life. So she basically had an issue with blood. All right, I'll just leave it at that. You can research that. You can ask Miss Mary after. You can ask Miss Mary about that afterward. Yep, oh, absolutely. Thank you. You're not All right. Courtney. So... This woman, she's lived with this problem for 12 years. The problem with it is she was deemed unclean. She couldn't enter the temple. She couldn't worship. She couldn't basically hang out with anybody. She's constantly in pain, suffering from disease and the cures. There's, there's no cure for it. And it's constantly considered to be unclean by religious people. She's exhausted all her resources and all her options. She comes with a touch of faith, thinking if I can even touch his garments, I will be made well. She has this genuine faith, but it's a faith that needs instruction. Jesus, not his garments, killed this woman. Power had gone out from him. We don't need a, a trick or a life hack to fix us. We need a person. We need Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can heal us, that can restore us. Jesus calls for this woman to identify herself. He doesn't want her healing to be a secret, but to use it as an opportunity for discipleship. He tells her, go in peace. Peace is more than just this temporary healing. Your faith has saved you, Jesus says. He lost power so that she could gain strength, and one day he will lose his life so that she and all of us could live forever. Jesus takes time to engage this woman, so she comes up to him after this guy Jairus has come up to him and said, hey, my daughter's about to die. She's literally on, my, on her deathbed. I need you to come, like, right now. 
And the, the, just picture the anxiety that Jairus is facing. Jesus stops in the middle of them going to talk to this woman. The worry of the disciples. And the Jesus is perfectly composed and giving this woman attention if, if she's the only thing that matters. But it seems like a catastrophic delay. In Mark chapter 5, verse 35, 36, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Let's just picture that. Jairus' daughter is now dead, and is like, Dude, Jesus, this woman, she's been sick for like 12 years. She's fine. Let's, you can come back to her in a minute. My daughter, she's on her deathbed. She's got moments, seconds. And you're talking with this stinking woman that's, who's unclean. Jesus, he's saying, I'm right on time. Trust me. Be patient with the way that I will resolve this. There will be more than you ever expected. Tim Keller said, be aware that when you go to Jesus for help, you will both give to you and get from him far more than you bargained for. You will need the truth, but now and in the future. In Jairus' home, they were already preparing for a funeral. She was taking her last breath. She's dead. They're already starting to make arrangements. I know that's quick. Look at verse 38 of chapter 5. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when they had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha, come on, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. For she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. He tells her, little girl, get up. It's like he says, honey, it's time to get up. And reaching down into death, he gently lifts her out of it. Jesus' hands, death itself, it's nothing but sleep. He, he, he's basically saying, you know, death, you know, I control you. I got power over you. And then in verse 43, and then he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Jesus leaves the scoffers in unbelief. People are out there making fun. Oh, man, he ain't going to be able to do nothing. Maybe they're thinking, well, this little girl is just asleep after all. She had no pulse. She was dead. Even watching a miracle happen right in front of their eyes does not change people. They need new hearts to receive Jesus for who and what he is. Jesus still raises the dead. It is Jesus telling you it's time to get up. It's time to walk around and follow me. Let him lift you out of your deadly sleep and into life. Are you being raised to life? I'm going to ask you a question. What about you? Where does life feel chaotic to you? Where are you experiencing fear? What feels like just bewildering to you? That you feel like life is out of control? Maybe you're like a woman. Been dealing with something for a long time. Maybe you're like Jairus. Something in the moment where some, something drastic is about to happen. Maybe you're, you're like the demon possessed man. And, and you're just like, you know who God is. But you're like, man, nah. I don't, I, don't, I, mean, I don't want nothing with God. Maybe you're just afraid like the disciples. Yeah, I come to church. Yeah, I, I come to youth group. I go to camp. But I'm scared. Yeah, you know, God, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to use you when I need a good grade on a test. Somebody's sick. I'll, I'll say, God, help, help them feel better. We need to all receive Jesus as he is speaking peace and healing in our chaos. So, so tonight, let me ask you a question. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you, you have peace in the midst of a chaotic world? Do you have hope that he gives? Only Jesus can give that. 
That demon possessed man couldn't heal himself. It had to be Jesus. That little girl couldn't be raised from the dead. It had to be Jesus. The other woman, she couldn't be healed. It had to be Jesus. We can't save ourselves. It has to be Jesus. This last weekend, we just celebrated Jesus dying for you and for me and raised for the dead. He conquered death in the grave because he loves you. So you can have hope. So you can have victory over everything that you face in this life when you put your trust in him. So do you have that hope? Do you have that personal relationship with Jesus? I'm going to pray and give you a chance to respond. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that you do. Lord, right now, God, I pray that if somebody watching or here in person, they don't have a relationship with you, God, I pray right now, you'll move in their heart. Soften hearts, Lord, draw people to you. We thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if, if you've made a decision to follow Christ or you have questions, 